Okay, so I think it's time to start. Uh, welcome everyone to this virtual DS presentation by Sarah Typhon. It's really a huge pleasure and honor for me to introduce Sarah. It's been hard to get her because she's such a popular and wanted speaker and, and, and uh, scientist. But we finally managed to get her and uh, for a DS presentation. And that's also why we didn't want to cancel it despite the COVID-19 lockdown. So it's wonderful. You were happy to still get the presentation, Sarah, uh, even under these circumstances, which we realize is far from optimal. But we would have loved to show you our new DS building and how interesting an environment that is, but that we'll have to wait for another time. But today, um, Sarah will tell us about her really interesting work on trying to map the human cell atlas. So this is an endeavor that she has spearheaded together with other colleagues who are looking at the human uh, organism at a per cell basis. So a little bit about Sarah's background. Uh, she um, was born and raised in Germany. And then she uh, went to uh, the UK for further studies. She did her PhD at the famous Institute of um, Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, uh, funded by MRC. And she started genome evolution and has stayed with the genome ever since. She then did a short postdoc at uh, University College London before going back to uh, uh, Cambridge and becoming a group leader at the very same institute as where she did her PhD, the LMB. In uh, 2006, she became group leader. And then uh, from in two, uh, 2013, she was appointed a joint position at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute and EBI, where she, since uh, 2016, has been head of cell genetics and uh, visiting research group leader at EBI. So she has this dual appointment. And her work is really focused on understanding uh, mechanisms of gene regulation, as well as uh, protein structure, protein complex formation, using a combination of both wet lab and uh, a computational approaches. As I said, she recently spearheaded this human cell atlas initiative um, and this is what she will talk about today. She's received numerous awards and uh, in connection with what she'll be talking about today, I can say that in this year, she, re uh, she was recognized by the Times as a, on the science power list for exactly this work that she will speak about today. So Sarah is a really real power woman, a real scientific superstar, and we're so thrilled uh, to that you're here and uh, will talk to us today. So a very warm welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Susanna, for that kind introduction. And thank you everybody for coming to this presentation virtually. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. So the human body, one cell at a time, that's what my research is about. And each of you has a body that consists of a fantastic diversity of cells that come together in different ways, in different organs. The body has many different types of cells with different shapes and functions. Every cell contains the same DNA. Our genome stays pretty much identical in every cell throughout the body. So why is each cell different? There's an invisible machinery that determines which genes are active in each cell. And a different set of active genes results in specific shapes and specific features and functions of cells. So what you can see on, on the left-hand side are fibroblasts, which are structural cells that are present in many tissues in our body. 
And on the right hand side is a neuron, which is of course specific to the brain and the nervous system. Historically, we've used microscopes to look at cells. And what they showed us is that there are cells with different shapes and different morphologies. Now we can understand in exquisite detail why they're different. Since 2010, we've been living through the resolution revolution in genomics, which allows us to see the invisible by single cell genomics, the genomics of individual cells one at a time. And this resolution revolution has, has uh, leveraged cutting edge technology to make it possible to sequence the tiny quantities of DNA or RNA in individual cells. And it's single cell RNA sequencing that enables us to quantify exactly which genes are switched on in every single cell. And so the workflow is shown on this slide where you start with a, a solid tissue, you then um, disaggregate the individual cells like those fibroblasts or the neurons that I showed you on the previous slide. They are isolated individually and then it's the, the RNA, the, the, the active genes that are then sequenced and quantified computationally. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about is the global consortium to map cells in the human body. Um, that's that's the, the project that aims to, to carry out this work. So the mission of the Human Cell Atlas Global Consortium is for, to provide a comprehensive reference map of the, the types of all human cells in the body as a basis for understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, and treating health and disease. So they are thought to be about 37 trillion cells in the human body. The history of this global consortium and this, this vision comes from um, sort of late 2015, early 2016, when I had the opportunity to take on the leadership of the cellular genetics program at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. And that job came with resources and um, uh, uh, possibilities that, that were very exciting. And leveraging that, my ambition was to map the human body with this new technology or relatively new technology at the, t at the time. And my partner in crime became Aviv Regev of the Broad Institute in Boston, who shared this vision and she coined the term human cell atlas, that you can see in the logo, and I developed the logo. And together, we then rallied the international community to get behind this vision and to form a global collaboration to map the human body. And so nowadays, the, the membership of HCA is global, it's growing, and it's open to any, anyone who wants to join. So, you know, I encourage you, if you're interested, to sign up in the registry at the bottom. We'll give you access to the newsletters, the meeting invitations, the corporate deals for, for consumables. And we now have almost 2,000 members in 71 countries across 1,000 different research institutes and 17 members in Denmark. So I think you get the feeling from this slide that the, the project is basically scientist-led, grassroots, bottom-up, and it, it encompasses people from many different countries. But I also want to emphasize that it encompasses a diversity of scientists from different disciplines. So you've already heard about the, a little bit about the technologies involved. I've mentioned computation of data analysis is involved. And of course, what's also key is to include the, the biomedical specialists who have knowledge about different tissues or ways of accessing particular samples that I'll talk about a bit later and so on. So this is a, a really diverse membership. It's growing and it's very open. Um, again, just to emphasize that we are keen on including researchers from all over the world. We have an equity and diversity working group that, that um, 
makes sure that meetings happen all over the world, that there are training sessions that are provided um, in, in all the continents. And, um, and, and what Aviv and I felt very strongly at the beginning was that it's not just what we do in HCA, but also how we do it that's important. And so we achieve, you know, we achieve the map of the human body in, um, in a way that's open and um, fair and diverse. And in terms of the, the biomedical specialties that are involved, it really, the project covers all 14 organ systems in the human body. And we've recently organized ourselves um, into a so-called biological networks where each one of them has, has subgroup leaders or has coordinators for that network to bring together the community of people who are, who are very interested in that system. So the eye, the heart, the lung, pancreas, kidney, reproduction, uh, etc. And the point of these working groups is that people who are interested in those tissues can exchange expertise, exchange top tips, knowledge, and so on about that tissue and work together in the most effective way, in a collaborative way, to achieve the most accurate and detailed map of that system or that tissue or that organ. And we also have at the bottom, I want to also highlight that there are dimensions of human development, so embryonic and fetal development, organoids, which are in vitro systems, so organs in a dish, and genetic diversity, meaning uh, uh, inter-individual variation in the human population. I want to spend a few more words on technology. I've emphasized that really what catalyzed this project was the resolution revolution genomics that allowed us to go from um, bulk studies of tissues to single cells. And, sorry, <clears throat> and um, uh, what I want to uh, um, use as a, as a sort of analogy here is the, the conventional bulk genomics that uses hundreds or thousands of cells as, or, or even more cells as input is kind of like a, a fruit smoothie or a milkshake where you're blending together many individual cells to read out the average properties of that ensemble of cells. The single cell genomics approaches that can resolve individual cells provide us with the selection of pieces of fruit that are inside the smoothie. But of course, what we want to get to is the cake the fruitcake, we want to understand human tissues in terms of their three-dimensional or maybe even four-dimensional if you add changes over time, organization, but we want to do that at the single cell level. And so that's where spatially resolved genomics methods, high throughput methods come in. So it's really the combination of the single cell genomics with the spatial methods that allows us to atlas individual tissues and to achieve that atlas with that coordinate system like you would have in a, in a map. Um, now, I want to illustrate the concept of single cell genomics a little bit more for people who aren't familiar with these methods using a video. Let's see if this works. Let's see if this video works. It works. Okay. I just have to press the button. So this is one technology that allows you to capture individual cells. The video is very clear. You see the little yellow ball going through a microfluidic chip. And the, the ball here is trapped in the chamber. The second ball is trapped in the chamber. And the third little yellow cell whizzing around, the third cell gets trapped in the chamber. Now, this isn't the most common technology that's used. It's usually nowadays it's droplet microfluidics rather than chip microfluidics. But the concept of having to trap a single cell one at a time in a highly multiplex way gets across. The second step of single cell genomics is, involves lysing that cell, opening up the cell, and getting out the nucleic acid content inside. And you'll see that happening next. Um, the, the, cell, the little yellow cell is going in. And then uh, the lysis reagents break the cell membrane, open it up, allow all the nucleic acid content to spill out inside the instrument, and that now gets, um, pr gets prepared and amplified in such a way that it can then go into next generation sequencing. And so that's really the, the, the basis of, of single cell genomics. And coupled with the spatial methods that I, uh, I haven't showed you in detail, we'll come on to that later, what we're aiming to do 
is to create a Google map of the human body. And so here, um, what we want to do is really to get from the Google continents to the Google cities, to the, the real street maps view, where we know where each cell is in its neighborhood, who are its neighbors, and what, is the, the, what are the characteristics of each cell. So the idea of, of the human cell atlas is that it allow everybody to navigate from that whole organ level down to the individual cell level. Here you can see the blue nuclei of each individual cell with fluorescence microscopy. So what is the impact of having a human cell atlas? Having a reference atlas will of course provide us with much more detailed knowledge about the human body than we ever had before. And that may uh, you know, satisfy many people's curiosity about how our tissues function in a lot of detail. And I'm one of those people. I think that's really important knowledge to have uh, in, an, in and of itself. Beyond that, um, we can begin to see now the implications for medical research that the healthy reference atlas is having. They include regenerative biology, in other words, how to create cells by engineering them in a dish, cells and, and tissues. They include understanding of disease mechanisms. And that's a second area that I'll talk about in this presentation. They include drug discovery, toxicities, diagnostics, and genetic variants, both rare and common. And I won't go into those areas. But this is, this is a, a slide from our white paper that we, that we put out on the internet a few years ago. And it's one of the reasons these areas of impact, the implications for medical, for medicine, are a major driver for the excitement and interest in the human cell atlas, both by scientists, the biomedical community, and by funders. And so that's one of the drivers for the hundreds of millions of dollars that funders have invested in the project is, is the translational implications. So we're very excited about the pure knowledge and discovery, all the discoveries that we're making, but it's also the medical impact that gets a lot of people excited. And I'll talk about the regenerative biology and the disease mechanisms later. So examples of human cell atlas data today, where we stand today, where this is slightly out of date, but roughly, is that um, for the kidney, up here on, on the right, we've got close to a million cells um, uh, profiled by single cell genomics. These are all numbers for single cell genomics, not, not, not the spatial. And we have that for many dozens of individuals and, and over 100 samples. For the skin, close to a million cells. For the, for the lung, over a million cells from different parts of the airways. For the gut, over a million cells. These are taking together data from many groups around the world and putting it together. For human development, the, this is the largest number of cells. Of course, in, this includes many tissues and many developmental stages, almost four and a half million. And, and for the liver, over 100,000 cells. So this is just six vignettes giving you an idea of where we stand today. This, we're still in the early phases of this project, but we're already starting to get very high resolution data that's telling us about the, the, the cells in detail in these, in these organs. What I want to do next is to uh, uh, go into a little bit of detail on one tissue that my research group has been studying um, for the past five years or so. Hmm. Let's not go, ah, here we go. Which is the human uterus, the female reproductive system. So I think this is a really interesting and uh, special tissue because it has this dynamic property of regenerating every month. And um, so really to understand the, the tissue, the endometrium, which is the inside lining of the uterus, the myometrium is the muscular layer on the outside and the endometrium is the lining on the inside. 
we need to really follow the different stages of the monthly cycle. So you've got the shedding happening at the beginning of the, of the cycle. Then there's a proliferative phase where the cells are building up and regenerating the tissue. And then there's a secretory phase, which is also the window of implantation of the embryo in pregnancy. And surprisingly, this tissue is quite understudied and, um, and we, we have limited knowledge about the architecture and cells inside the tissue. So really knowing what are the cells and how do they relate to each other and how do they change over time every month is, um, is, is uh, there are lots of open questions. So the way we, we are studying this tissue and this is unpublished data that I'm telling you now, it's kind of exciting ongoing research, is using spatial transcriptomics, which you can see are these, um, these grids with circular voxels on them. And every voxel contains roughly 10 to 40 or so cells. So this isn't quite single cell genomics, but combined with studying the, these, this, um, the single cell transcriptomes of these tissue samples, we can, we can computationally deconvolute each voxel in terms of the cell composition and then infer where each cell population is sitting in two dimensions. And of course, we can reconstruct the depth in three dimensions if we take consecutive sections. So the way these, these individual um, tissue sections in these spatial transcriptomics chips are organized in this, uh, in this slide, in this presentation, is that the, the interior, the lumen, is on the top, and the myometrium, which is that muscular layer that you can see here, is on the bottom. Now, um, what we discovered are glandular epithelial cell populations. So these are the cells that are secreting into the, um, out of the glands during the secretory phase. And um, you can see that they're basically distributed um, in, in little clusters from the basal layer up to the lumen of the endometrium. Another exciting uh, discovery that we're making is that there are different stromal cell types that really determine the structure and architecture of this tissue. So it's known that it's kind of a zonated tissue like our skin um, because there are different densities of cells when you look at the bright field images under the microscope, but it's poorly understood what actually um, the different layers consist of in terms of the cellular and molecular composition of each layer. And what, we, what I'm showing here on the top right is a stromal cell population that's, that's uh, in this endometrium that's very similar to decidualized stromal cells um, in, the, in the pregnant uterus, which is called the decidua when, when implantation takes place, embryonic implantation takes place. So you can see these cells are red, which means they are highly present and expressed in the top layer. Whereas if we look at the bottom left, what we can see is that there's a basal population of fibroblasts that's specifically located in the bottom layer. And so these are the cells that are really providing that zonated structure of this tissue. They're the kind of, as I said, fibroblasts are sort of the structural building blocks of tissues. And, um, and we can see different types of subpopulations very clearly when we look at the, how they are organized in these tissue sections in two-dimensional space. What we can also see are different epithelial cell populations. I've mentioned the glandular ones at the top, and there are also ciliated ones that are LGR5 positive, which is a marker of stem cells in colonic crypts. And here we see the LGR, LGR5 positive epithelial cells in the endometrium um, located in the top of the, and the inside of the, of the endometrium in the luminal layer and also specific novel ciliated cell, epithelial cell populations, cilia are little hairs that are on top of the cells. And so this, is, this basically gives you a feeling for how we can start deconstructing a tissue and, and sort of building it back together in a cellular and molecular sense using spatial transcriptomics technology coupled with single cell RNA sequencing and interpreting the data computational and summarizing a lot here in a single slide. Now, what I showed you just now is limited by the granularity of the individual voxels, which are 50 microns across. 
and which contain more than one cell, as I mentioned. In order to get to the, the real single cell resolution, what we're using here is um, multiplex single molecule fluorescence in situ hybridization, so microscopy with fluorescent probes for specific genes that are shown on the left and DAPI that marks the nuclei in blue. And what's in each column is a different phase of the menstrual cycle. So we're starting with that proliferative phase where we're building up the tissue and then we're going to different stages of proliferative and then the secretory until the end of the cycle on the right hand side. And so what you can see, for instance, for this matrix metalloprotease gene, MMP7, is that expression rises during mid to late proliferative phase. So that's these, these two um, um, slides here. And, um, and, and, and it's very high in the lumen. So the lumen is, is the empty region on the right-hand side, the inside of the uterus. The myometrium is on the left-hand side of each of these slides. So this is rotated by 90 degrees compared to the previous slide. And, um, and then later in, in the cycle of, during the secretory phase, that gene is basically uh, draws back just to the deep glands closer to the myometrium, um, as you can see here where I'm pointing with my pointer, and then it gradually disappears and is, is, is only present in, in, in the lumen um, pr uh, prior to menstruation. Um, PAEP, the green gene, is a gene that's known to be a marker of, of secretory epithelial cells in the glands. And you can see its distribution um, uh, mirrors the, the other gene. In the, you can see the round circles, which are the glands, are very beautifully clear in this imaging data. and um, PAP7 dominates until the, the epithelial cells and the glands until the end of the cycle um, and, and stays all the way through. So these genes are markers of different cell types. You can see their distribution changes over time and changes in space. And, um, and, and together with the genomics approaches, this imaging basically helps us get to the Google Maps view of this tissue if we take all the data together. I hope it's clear. Now, as part of this work, which is a collaboration with Margarita Turco in the pathology department and uh, Rosa Vento, who's a young group leader in the cellular genetics program, what we're also doing is uh, taking principles that we learn from these samples of the in vivo uterus that are from deceased transplant donors in, in the hospital here in Cambridge, where we collaborate very closely with transplant surgeons to acquire these samples. And um, uh, uh, the principles about the cells and their neighborhoods, which cells are close to each other and which cells are likely to signal to each other and so on. Um, allow us to inform the, the uh, making an endometrium in a dish, so making endometrial organoids. And Margarita Turco has cultured these organoids. They, this, is, um, this, this, this protocol was published um, a couple of years ago in Nature Cell Biology by, by her group. And um, uh, what, it, what it allows us to do is to take a biopsy from a fresh tissue sample, uh, digest the tissue down to single cells, culture them in matrigel, that's what we can see here, and then passage them for a couple of weeks to establish organoid cultures. Now from the, um, from the, the in vivo cell atlas that I just showed you, we know that there are different cell types. I showed you the, the, the secretory gland, glandular cells, the ciliated cells, so there are different subtypes that a stem cell is differentiating into and recurring every month. And from the spatial organization of the cells, we can tell what those fibroblasts, those structural cells, are, are what the signals are secreted by them and what signals they're sending to the epithelial cells to make those different lineages. Now that's, that's a, a hypothesis that we can't test in a living person but we can test it in this culture system in a dish. And what we did was to, to 
to engineer the cultures with different ligands and different inhibitors and to make uh, different types of organoids. So to make fake uterus that has only ciliated cells or fake uterus that has only uh, glandular secretory epithelial cells. And so um, in my mind, this is how we can connect the human cell atlas with organ engineering to make better in vitro models based on the principles that we learn from in vivo tissue architecture. So it's a bit like uh, the um, God basically engineering the human kind of as an analogy. You can also, another way to think about it is that the human cell atlas data from in vivo human tissues gives us a recipe for how to improve our engineered in vitro systems. So the, the endometrial cell atlas tells us it has the, the recipe inside it, the data inside it, how to make really lifelike endometrial organoids using the cell surface receptors that we predict for every cell type in the in vivo tissue, using the, the predicted secreted factors that are signaling to those ligands inside the tissue, and then using cell culture media and matrigel and so on, we can adapt the um, the growth of the cell, the, the, the how we grow the cells. So that's an example of the impact that the in vivo human cell atlas, the healthy reference cell atlas, can have for regenerative biology. A little bit more detail on the endometrium. Um, I want to go back to a couple of years ago when Rosa Venter was still a postdoc in my group and spearheaded the, the atlas of the maternal fetal interface. So the maternal fetal interface is where the, the pregnant version of the endometrium, the decidua, meets the placenta. And of course, that's a really exciting interface from an immunology point of view, which is my little hobby, my special interest is immunology. Um, and, and because it poses a conundrum for how the maternal immune system can tolerate those paternal antigens that are in the fetus and that are in the, expressed in the placenta. So of course the placenta is um, derived from the embryo, it's part of the, the embryo itself, although it's extra embryonic, and that means that its genome is 50% maternal and 50% paternal. And so where the placenta embeds into the uterus, into the decidua, the maternal immune system is seeing uh, paternal antigens, which are foreign. And so it's a bit of a situation like a tumor where you have somatic mutations um, and the, the really um, unanswered question is how does the maternal immune system tolerate those foreign antigens? Okay. And so that was the question that we set out to answer a few years ago. And one of the answers that came out of that, so I want to give you a, a different view of the tissue now, which is the immune system and these natural killer cells that are um, specific populations that we discovered inside the decidua. That's why they're called DNK1, DNK2, DNK3. So it was known that there were uterine NK cells that were special but what we were able to do was to define these three subpopulations and we were able to distinguish exactly which receptors are sitting on the surface of each of these cell types and how they're interacting with those extravillous trophoblast cells from the placenta that carry the paternal antigens. And um, it's really that interaction between the HLA-C, which is the presented, which contains paternal HLA, and the key receptors on the NK cells um, that, that has to elicit tolerance rather than killing by these NK cells. And so what this work uh, uh, revealed in, in kind of molecular, more molecular detail is how the NK cells act in an immunosuppressive manner rather than a, um, a cell killing manner and how they interact also with the fibroblasts in the, in the uterus and the decidua on the maternal side. And so this is, um, this is basically a, a, a view onto the tissue in terms of the, the immune cells that are there. I've told you about the fibroblasts that are the structural cells and the epithelial cells that are the cells that are kind of doing the functions in the individual tissues. 
So all of our tissues are composed of mainly those lineages. So the structural cells, the immune cells, and the functional cells in some sense. Okay, so um, that's some insight into a uh, healthy reference atlas from um, uh, an interesting dynamic tissue, uh, the, the endometrium. What I want to go on to next is um, comparing a healthy reference atlas with a particular inflammatory disease, and that is asthma. So the other, um, the other application that I said that the human cell atlas has is um, as, as a way of understanding disease mechanisms. And in this project, uh, we are studying the human airways. And in particular, we're taking biopsies from living volunteers and asthmatic patients. So this is work that was done in Groningen by um, uh, Martin van der Berger and Martin Nguyen. And we are taking the parenchyma, the alveoli, from deceased transplant donors from our Cambridge transplant surgery program with coruscant palsy. So these are different types of ways of getting access to healthy human reference tissue. One is biopsy and one is deceased transplant donor tissue that's taken, the tissue is taken straight after uh, when the organs are taken for transplantation. So the, the biopsy tissue basically told us about the, the, the large uh, bronchi, so the, the, um, the larger generations of the divisions of the airways. And you can see here, there are, uh, uh, when we drill into de in detail, there are about 30 or 40 different cell types that we were able to describe. And we're able to find new epithelial cell states and new T cell states which we were specifically interested in because they play an important role in asthma. In the parenchyma, we were able to get a healthy reference map from the deceased transplant donor tissue, and you can see about a dozen different cell types here. Well, we were with a focus on the um, epithelial and endothelial cells, the, the, the vessels. So in asthma, what happens is that the normal airways become inflamed and thickened, and the tightening basically leads to uh, um, respiratory distress. And as I said, the way we got that asthmatic tissue was um, by bronchoscopy upon sedation of asthmatic uh, patients. And we contrasted that with a cohort of healthy volunteers. And in this case, um, the cells were studied using microfluidic droplets. So this is, a, I showed you the chip animation, the film of the single cells being trapped inside chips. Here we're using um, that current te technology of microfluidic droplets that you can see here, where the individual cells <clears throat> are flowed into a microfluidic circuit. They meet beads and are encapsulated in droplets. And we're then able to map out the epithelial cells in the bronchi, in the parenchyma, and actually also in the upper airways, in other words, in the nose. And we're able to define these cells uh, in unprecedented detail. And I'll give you a specific example of <coughs> a couple of cell types that we discovered in the nose, in the nasal epithelium, and that is ciliated cells that are shown here with those cilia, those little uh, um, hair-like protrusions in yellow, a goblet cell type, in other words, a secretory mucus-producing cell in, in brown, and then a different goblet cell state in beige. And what you're seeing here is the nasal lumen, the cavity is on the top, and then the, the tissue, the blood vessels, and so on are on the bottom. And I want to highlight that particular goblet cell state that, that's uh, interacting very vigorously with immune cells, with T cells and dendritic cells through receptor ligand intercellular communication. And we describe these cells in, in the paper, mostly, most details is in the supplementary material. And then, of course, what hit us recently is the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the COVID-19 pandemic. And what became clear then, uh, um, or what's been known for a long time, is that coronavirus enters epithelial cells in our body via the ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme on the surface of the cells. I'm showing that here in this little blue uh, receptor picture. 
And um, that enzyme is essentially the receptor for the virus to enter inside the cells. And it happens that that goblet cell site that we described in the nose has a very high expression of ACE2 and has this, this more active immune signaling phenotype compared to the other epithelial cells in the nose. And so that really uh, segs me in from asthma to uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 research. And, and um, I'll talk about this for the next few minutes. So as you know, the coronavirus has the spike protein on the surface of its membrane. And that spike protein shown in turquoise binds to the ACE2 receptor on the surface of epithelial cells in our body. Actually, not just epithelial cells, it's now hypothesized. We, we actually show that there are some other cell types that also express the receptor, fibroblasts and parasites. And then the protease temporis 2 is needed in order for the virus to, um, to then enter inside cells and do its nasty work to us. So the question that we asked is, where is that receptor expressed in healthy tissues? And also, where is the protease Tempris 2 that's required and other proteases expressed throughout the body? And I've mentioned to you that in the nose, which is the nasal cavity is highlighted here in, in, in the ring-like structure, we saw that very high expression in that, that goblet cell state that I explained. And the reason that that was so exciting to um, scientists working on the, the epidemic is that that has implications for transmissivity. So of course, the, the, what ha has to happen early in the infection is that the virus is transmitted from one person to another person, and that can only happen through cells. So the virus can only stay alive in living human cells. And so the cells that are infected initially uh, um, are most likely to be in barrier tissues in our body. So that includes the nose, of course, and here you can see that goblet cell state that has that very high ACE2 expression that I showed you is sitting inside our nasal epithelium. Now, if we go to um, the bronchi, which, which I showed you, we also worked on with that bronchoscopy tissue from, from our Dutch collaborators. In, the, in, in those lower airways, in the bronchi, they are also ciliated in club cells, so also epithelial cells that have the receptor. Probably a bit harder for the virus to get in there, to get down there, but it's, the nose is certainly very easy. And then <coughs> if we go down inside the lungs and the alveoli, then there's that alveolar type 2 cell that has high expression of, of, the, um, of the ACE2 receptor and the tympus protease. And that has been known for a long time to express the receptor uh, and, and was discovered in 2004 as a ACE2 expressing cell using immunohistochemistry um, by the uh, group in Groningen. Now, what we discovered was that there are also specific cells in the eye that express the receptor at high levels. And this, this uh, is from uh, analysis of data from the LACO group up in Manchester, who uh, during the pandemic very generously released their data publicly for analysis. And um, that, uh, that meant that we were able to see that, excuse the pun, that um, there are superficial conjunctival cells and also corneal epithelial cells that express the ACE2 receptor. And of course, that could explain um, some of the, um, uh, the disease symptoms in the eye and could uh, implicate the nasolacrimal duct as a, um, a transmission route for the infection. <clears throat> if we um, go down inside our data from the, um, um, from the gastrointestinal tract, we can see in the small and large intestine, there, uh, this is from the small intestine, there are epithelial cells these so-called enterocytes that express the receptor. And of course, there are also um, uh, diarrhea and so on, symptoms of the disease. But importantly, what this means is that the oral fecal route of transmission is also a possible um, transmission route. So I've described the, the airways, the eyes, and this is now the, the oral fecal route in the intestines. 
the mouth and intestines. Finally, another barrier tissue that expresses the, um, the receptor is both the decidua, these decidual stromal cells that I highlighted to you before sit at the top of the, the, the endometrium in the, in the late stages of the menstrual cycle and also during the decidualized, um, um, during decidualization during pregnancy, and also perivascular cells that sit around vessels. So it's not only epithelial cells, all the previous data that I've shown you is epithelial cells. These are now fibroblasts and perivascular cells that also express the receptor. And of course, the, the concerning thing here is that those maternal uh, stromal cells are sitting next to fetal syncytiotrophoblasts in the placenta. And so this indicates there may be a mechanism for vertical transmission from mother to fetus of the disease. Now, this is likely to be very, very rare based on the data that's currently published and, and what we're aware of. There are very, very few uh, reports of maternal fetal transmission in the literature. But for those rare instances, this provides some insight into pos possible mechanisms of transmission. And we map many other tissues in the human body that, um, that show uh, uh, sites of expression of the ACE2 receptor. What I'm focusing on here are the barrier tissues because those are the tissues that uh, where the healthy reference data that we have so much of in the human cell atlas can provide mechanistic insights into the, the transmission of the disease and the very early stages of infection. Later, there'll be later stages during the pathogenesis where there'll be, there'll be uh, the immune system will be involved, there'll be um, a, a lot of remodeling of the tissue and so on. And for those later stages of the disease, the healthy reference data is less informative. So that's why I'm focusing on, on these tissues. So um, what I've told you in terms of stories of the impact of the human cell atlas is um, the disease mechanisms for the SARS-CoV-2 viral entry. And also, uh, uh, previously, when I talked about the uterus in a dish, um, the insights that we can leverage for um, uh, uh, cell culture and regenerative biology. What I told you about in terms of uh, stories about um, healthy reference atlas, understanding tissues in more detail, was about the lung and also our work on the uterus and the maternal fetal interface. And so that really takes me to the, at the end of my presentation. I finished a bit earlier than I expected, but that gives us more time for questions. So thank you everybody for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, sir, for this uh, fantastic uh, talk and also for um, highlighting the importance in the COVID-19 uh, 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 research and to understand mechanisms. So I'll try to uh, moderate discussions and I suggest that people having questions, they raise their hand and then I'll uh, try to do, give people a chance to ask questions um, uh, in the order they, they raise their hand. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, it would, I think it would be great if people switch on their video so we can actually see each other. So Kim, you have a first question. Yes, thank you Susanna and thank you very much uh, Sarah for a great introduction and, and uh, walk through to, uh, through some of your, your most recent work. It's, it's really impressive and, and I think we are all very grateful for this initiative. I mean it's a very important resource for, for many of us uh, really. Um, I was curious about uh, the spatial uh, transcriptomics, where, which I guess is sort of the next uh, uh, sort of challenge to, to really, um, to really uh, understand the complexity of, of, of tissues. Um, so you showed very nicely how you could sort of uh, combine single cell data, spatial transcriptomic data, and then also validate uh, using single molecule fish. Uh, could, you, mm -hmm. could you have come to the same conclusions skipping the, the spatial transcriptomics data so 
based on your single cell data, do multiplex single molecule uh, fish. So, um, I mean, the, the simple answer is not, not in the same complexity. So you can do multiplex fish um, for, uh, and, and you know, there are, there are highly multiplex methods like Seekfish and Murfish and as you know star map and so on and so forth um and and yes they allow you to validate individual cell populations or combinations of populations the the why i've become you know i've become really really excited about the spatial transcriptomics is that you don't need you you, you don't need to have a hypothesis <laughs> Now, now, mechanistic kind of um, old school biology will hate me for saying that, but you know it. Well, or put it a different way, you don't. You know, by the time you analyze the data, you can have a million different hypotheses, and you can ask them again and again of the same experiment. Okay, that's a different way to put it, <laughs> and that's the super cool thing about the spatial transcriptomics. So, of all the cell populations that we discover in the single cell RNA seq. We can then ask, you know, for every single combinate, for every single one, and for every single combination, where do they sit? Do they tend to be co-occurring more frequently than expected by chance? You know, what is their pattern of distribution um, globally? You know, in every section that we sequence, uh, do, do you see the difference? Sure. And I guess so, also part of my question is if you yeah. can do that with the current resolution. Uh, when you combine with single cell uh, data? To a large degree. So before I gave this presentation, one of my postdocs was pre presenting data uh, on the heart to my, my program, my department. And, um, uh, you know, he was using our heart cell atlas data that's on bioarchive and then integrating with the left ventricle spatial transcriptomics that's, that's publicly available on the 10X website. So that wasn't, you know, that wasn't something that we had planned. But be anyway, in the COVID situation, we're starting to get creative. And so he took that data and our single cell RNA seq and just, you know, mapped everything um, kind of in an unbiased manner. Where do all the cell states sit? Which ones are co occurring more frequently than expected by chance? And hence, likely signaling to each other or, or, or a, a form forming a kind of tissue unit. You know, and that uh, that kind of blew me away. Um, is how powerful that is. Uh, and and yes, we also you know we're always going to probably drill into details with microscopy methods. You know, with multiplex fish and so on. But I mean, the the spatial methods, even at fifty micron resolution, it is incredibly powerful. Thank you. And then Lars. As a question, yeah. Thank you, Sarah, for this very nice talk, and uh, I mean, uh, very impressive Atlas project, uh, and and you get some really insights to to cellular identity. So my question is a very general question. Uh, so so cellular identities, you know, look traditional in textbooks, like you have this Waddington model where you get cells fixed in these uh, states. Uh, and uh, I mean, clearly, from all this single cell uh, data, you, you start to see these, uh, these uh, what do you call it, tones of states where cells can change a little bit of the identity. Uh, so, so how, how are, I mean, what, what is your opinion on, on, on cellular identity in general and, and how many different cells are actually in the human body, if you should give a number to that? <laughs> Um, I think it's a fun game to estimate the total number of, you know, cell states and cell types. Yeah. And I would say many thousands at this point, just from, you know, um, but we can, we can, we can all kind of guess and then, and then see who's closest in the end, like they did the, the bets that they did on the number of human genes. Um, 
So I think it's, but it's, it's clear that, you know, every sample that people have looked at, there are new discoveries. So there's much, much more there when we use transcriptomics than what we knew before from, from, from other technologies. Um, I mean, the question, the question that you're asking, I think, is a little bit about the flexibility of cells and how, how flexible they are to changing their phenotype. And I think that is, you know, super exciting, super interesting question. There's a big difference between what happens in vivo and what you can make forced to happen in vitro. So I don't know if you've seen the, the recent work from um, the Curler lab on human skin organoids, you know, where basically from, from, a, from an iPS cell clone, you're making an entire hair follicle, basically. And that's, you know, to me, that's a kind of small miracle because just starting from an iPS cell, you know, you're making so many different cell types together that are derived actually in vivo from different germ layers. So endoderm, mesoderm, and so on. Um, and how, how is that actually possible? I mean, um, so I think in, in the dish, we can, we'll be able to engineer a lot of cellular diversity and we can also force cells to interconvert artificially what, what may not happen you know, during normal human development or normal, let's say a normal differentiation trajectory in the body. Now we do see a little bit of you know, interesting stuff like unexpected interconversions in wound healing, for instance, in the, in the skin. There's cells that go back to stem cell state and then differentiate down a different lineage and so on. So, um, I mean, there are, there are kind of, you know, unexpected inter interconversions that can happen in vivo in tissues as well. Um, but I think basically we need to keep a, keep a very open mind with respect to what's possible in theory in terms of, you know, reorganization of chromatin, switching on of transcription factors. I think cells can be incredibly flexible. And, and that can be harnessed for engineering cells, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lokita, you have a question? Hi, Sarah. One, one wonderful talk. Um, Hi. So I, I, I have a question on um, the ACE2 expression in TMPRS. Yeah. So you looked at barrier tissues and... Um, no, so we looked at all the tissues in the paper, right? So this yeah. came out in Nature Medicine last month. Yeah. But here I was only presenting the barrier tissues. So from the barrier tissues and, you know, you know, coming in the, in the next coming months when we, when you probably have more tissues on COVID-19 patients. Now I was wondering, you know, does ACE2 expression and TMPRS expression, you know, what is its correlation? Maybe not in necessarily the, the pulmonary tissue, but in other tissues with, with or you know, positive or negative correlation with actually the incidence of, uh, of, of viral load in specific we don't know. tissues. Do you have any inclination? I was discussing that this morning. So we have tissues from internal tissues from deceased COVID-19 patients. Um, and, you know, analyzing them with, with ACE2 Pro, uh, with, um, with viral genomic, viral RNA probes yeah. for active virus and latent virus. Um, the... The thing with the deceased tissue, the p tissue from deceased patients, is that the viral titer is very different in, yeah. from one patient <clears throat> to the next. And by the time they're dead, in a way, the major wave of virus can be over. And a lot of the, the mechanisms that happen are because of the, the cytokine storm, the overactive immune system. So the, um, you know, the tissues look unhealthy and very different, but it's not necessarily that they have a high viral titer like in the individual cells. So I think it's, it's an interesting question and, you know, we're going to have to get, I mean, we have tissues from two deceased patients so far. And I mean, the literature so far, there's a bit of microscopy. There's a lot of PCR of tissues, which can give you some clues. Uh, for chimpanzee tissue, there's PCR we're from the Chinese yeah. group on bioarchive. So yes, there's viral load in all these tissues, but at the single cell level, there's not a lot of data at this point in time. I'm, I'm especially curious because there's other tissues where there is limited expression or very low expression observed, at least in the, in, in, in the, in the healthy samples or, or the, so the sort of uh, um, 
healthier people. And I wonder, you know, if you can even infer, you know, for the patients who are um, who are surviving, you know, let's say uh, COVID, but are you know are keep it, are being affected by secondary effects. If you could say something about, if you could interpret or infer, uh, you know, purely looking at the, the infection rate and, and the responses. Uh, if if I don't I don't know if uh, um, if if such uh, sampling is underway in Cambridge or, or elsewhere. Um, so from from living patients, it's only yeah. blood and blood, yeah. wash or nasal swab. Yeah. And I mean, it's and, hard to get other tissues from living patients, right? Yeah. It's and, hard to get ethics to, to sample any other tissue. Yeah. Okay. So Maria, I see you have a question. Um, hi. Um, hi. Thank you, Sarah, for the very interesting talk and um, it was very interesting to learn about all these technologies. Um, I have a question. So I'm one of those who do milkshake <laughs> analysis, combining many tissues together and running um, expression analysis on it. My question is, this is, you showed how this, um, this method can be used to understanding mechanism of disease, but how can it be applied on the populational based studies when you want to study in individual differences or between the people or predisposition to disease? how it's applicable and what does it take to make populational based studies? So that's a great question and, and, and there are two possibilities or two answers. One is um, the kind of easy route which people are using is to leverage the existing bulk data at population level and to deconvolute it at the single cell level um, so, or something like that and then um, you know, deconvoluting the bulk data based on limited single cell data, where the other way is to actually do single cell profiling on hundreds of donors. And there are a lot of projects around the world underway who are doing that now. Thank you. So I think we, we need to uh, end soon, but I, I have a sort of a more general question for you, Sarah. Sure. That is, so a lot of us are using uh, animal models, most notably uh, mouse models uh, for our investigations. And we're also doing single cell sequencing of, of mouse tissues. From your experience and your broad overview, how much do you think we can learn from this? How different is the tissue architecture between um, mice and humans? And, or it depends other a lot on the tissue. Susanna, it depends a lot on the tissue. So the tissues that I present, so the, the, the endometrium, the female reproductive system is very different between mouse mm -hmm. and human. Um, the, the mice don't have a menstrual cycle. They don't shed, right? They don't shed the layer and um, they don't have spiral arteries. The whole tissue architecture is completely different. The, the immune system that I'm so interested in, you know, the NK cell, compartment, for instance, or are very different in mice than in human. But those two systems are the fastest evolving, right? The, in, in all of all organ or tissue systems are the immune system and reproductive systems. For if you look at muscle, for instance, may, maybe it's completely identical. I think it, you know, we need to, we need to ask those questions in more detail. Yeah. Um, if you look at heart, you know, maybe very similar. Um, liver may be very similar. So I think we need to drill down in more detail. I mean, I was surprised the spleen, you know, which is the secondary lymphoid organ, part of the immune system, is very, I, I thought it would be identical, but it's very different between human and mouse. But so I, so I think those are the evolution of cells and tissues across organisms is, you know, super exciting, super interesting. And we're just starting to scratch the surface of that, that whole question, but it's obviously really important for understanding how good model systems are exactly. for different research questions. Yeah. Great. If there are no further questions, um, I want to thank you once more, Sarah, for an awesome talk. And I really look forward to truly welcoming you in Odin's uh, physically for a next visit. I hope it will be soon. And uh, let's all give her a warm hand. Thank you. 
and um, you will have meetings with some of us in a few minutes so um, uh, right. check in again fantastic yeah. i'll see you soon thank you everybody bye bye bye, bye.